Hello everybody and welcome back to the Mr. Francy channel. It's wonderful if you are back to have you back and if you are new, welcome, welcome, welcome. On this channel we talk about all different things. Predominantly I talk about reading but you never know, a surprise video may be just around the corner that has absolutely nothing to do with reading. That's the great thing about the fun Mr. Francy channel. I'm going to open up as I usually close with asking everyone to spread their sparkle energy all throughout the world. Now what do I mean when I say that? I mean to take a moment to do something positive for someone else, whether it is to compliment them, uh, to hold out a chair, open a door, uh, let someone go ahead of you in the grocery line. Uh, yeah, just lift someone's spirits, raise their spirits for the day. The world can always do with more positive energy, and if you can spread yours, that would be an amazing thing. Can you believe we are in July? I mean, well, <laughs> truthfully, at the time of recording, I will be in July <laughs> in about four hours because it's the 30th of June in the evening for me at the time of recording. But still, I've gotten through my entire June TBR already and today we are doing a video that is uh, one of only two controversial videos I do every year that you all seem to love, which I think is just fantastic. It is part of my favourites and non-favourites series. Now that we are over halfway through the year, I am doing my favourites and non-favourites for the first half of the year, and this particular video is entitled The Worst Books That I Read in the First Half of 2024. Controversial in that normally I am all about spreading that sparkling energy, and I will be again after this video, but in the worst uh, books videos uh, that I do twice a year, once for the halfway mark, once at the end of the year, uh, I get the opportunity to adorn my darker aura, if you will. <laughs> See, I'm laughing because <laughs> it's just not natural for me, but anyway, adorn my darker era, if you will, <laughs> and um, talk about the books that uh, I really wasn't happy with. Now, now, interestingly, I don't have any one-star books for the first half of the year. I do have one two-star, and I have, let's just check the numbers here, uh, 12 uh, three-stars. So I will talk about those 13 books, the uh, 12 three-stars and the one two-star, and just go through certain memories and certain things. We'll see how we go. This is in no particular order with the three-stars. Obviously, um, the worst book is the one that got two-stars, but let's just just jump right in. Um, this is uh, really fantastic. Uh, there is a statistics uh, page of, of everyone on everyone's Goodreads, and uh, yeah, if you check that out uh, at any point throughout any year uh, or any years, each year that you've been on uh, uh, Goodreads, I've been on Goodreads since 2020, uh, you can check out your statistics, and so it just makes life a heck of a lot easier. But let's just jump right in. I'm not going to do a a countdown from 10 to 1. We're just talking three stars and then we'll talk the two star book. And again, in no particular ranking order. So, the first three star book we're going to talk about is one that changed a lot for me with the course of a series I was reading. So that book is called Roast Mortem, and it is book number nine in the Coffee House Mystery series by Cleo Coyle. Okay, so I was really enjoying my journey with the Coffee House Mystery series. It is an adult cozy mystery series by, um, by Cleo Coyle, and I don't remember how many books there are in the series, but I plan to get through all of them this year. Uh, in fact, I have that here. There are 20. Yeah. So, interestingly enough, I got through book nine, I started book ten, then DNF'd book ten, and DNF the rest of the series, so I didn't even make it to the halfway mark, but I was very close to making it to the halfway mark of this series. I still have the books. It's hard for me to unhaul them, but I think at some point I inevitably will. Let me explain why. So, particularly when it came to Roast Mortem, one of the biggest issues that I had was that... Um, I was wishing that there was more Madame in the book and in the books overall. So, a very quick um, background for you in case you haven't read the series before. It is a very beloved cozy mystery series, and I do recommend it if you love coffee, because Cleo Coyle, her passion for coffee shines through the uh, protagonist who, I forgot her name, 
Claire. Yeah, Claire Cosi of all names, right? Cosi, Cosi. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, so very, very, very coffee, coffee, coffee to the umpteenth degree. If you love coffee, I recommend giving it a go. You'll probably love the series. But um, Claire um, works at this cafe that is uh, owned by Madame. Madame is Claire's ex-husband and father of her child, um, ch- child, children, trying to remember. Anyway, um, coffee house. So, um, yeah, so we have Claire, Claire's ex, father of her, her child or children, and his mum, whose name is Madame. I love Madame. Madame is a senior, but my goodness, does she have this way about her. She is just hilarious. I, I love seniors in cozies that have a sense of humor and my goodness is madame completely unexpected in uh just in the way that she is but unfortunately it seems that uh with the books in the series and i only started realizing this in book nine with rose morton that madame would be in the first half of the book and then suddenly she is gone for like the majority of the second half it's like she's there she's very involved she's not a side character at all there will be the murder because there's always a murder in a cozy so that's not a spoiler but there'll be the murder that takes place and madame will say all right claire let's go and solve this murder (laughs) i listen to it on audio and that's how madame sounds on the audiobook all right claire let's go and solve the murder I'm very excited. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, so they're going and they're trying to work out what's going on with the murder, Madame being very heavily involved. And then it's almost as though we don't see this, but Madame says, all right, Claire, I'm getting a bit tired now. I'm going to go and have a nap. And so she goes and has this nap and we don't see her again until the end of the book. And it really annoys me because it's not the same without Madame. The mystery in this book did not intrigue me at all. I found myself reaching for the coffee cozy stuff just to get me through. Um, but even that, this time regarding ways to prepare coffees for roasting, wasn't as good as some of the other books, which are really detailed. Um, and yeah, it just, yeah really wasn't good. And as I say, ultimately I ended up DNFing the Coffee House Mystery Series. I replaced it with the Millie Cruise Ship Mystery Series by Hope Callahan. And so far I'm enjoying that one a whole lot more. So there you go. Uh, the next one that I'm going to mention is sadly book number 10. Oddly enough, I actually did get through book number 10. It must've been book number 11 that I, uh, DNF. So I did make it to the halfway mark, but, uh, yeah, book number 10, uh, in that same series is called murder by Mocha again, by Cleo Coyle again, an adult crazy mystery. And, uh, my thoughts on this one was that there was no real improvement on book nine. I was really hoping to love the Mocha moments of the book, but even that didn't exactly wow me. Again, Again, as with book nine, I love when Madame is there, but she's not there enough. The reveal, once again, was a letdown. The book wasn't horrible. It doesn't deserve one or two stars, but it wasn't amazing. And so, yeah, I went into uh, book number 11, which I actually purchased as a hardcover, um, because uh, it, in all honesty, the hardcover was cheaper than the paperback. And I was excited to have a cozy mystery in a hardcover, because the only hardcovers of cozies I have are the um, Christmas Tree Farm uh, series books by uh, Julie and Lindsay, a.k.a. Jacqueline Frost, on the cover. Um, so I was excited about that, but then I got maybe about a quarter of the way through and just went, yeah, no, nah, it's just not working for me anymore. So there you go. Uh, the next book that I'm going to talk to you all about is uh, Farm to Trouble by Amanda Flower. Now, Amanda Flower is my favourite uh, female cosy mystery author of all time. In fact, she has a shelf on my bookshelves dedicated just to her with one outward-facing cosy mystery book. That shelf is completely full. If I turn that book around and to the um, spine-facing way, there will probably be enough room for three more books, and then I have an entire shelf that is absolutely packed to the, the brim with Amanda Flower books. In saying that, I always had this saying uh, growing up, which is if I love someone enough, I love them enough to be able to criticize them. And so I do love Amanda Flower, but I struggled with Farm to Trouble. Now, 
This is the, fir- sorry, uh, yeah, Farm to Trouble, which is the first book in the Farm to Table uh, cozy mystery trilogy by Amanda Flower. So, look, I said I picked up this book because I'm trying to read all of Amanda Flower's work. Sadly, the cozy side did not work for me at all. The mystery was okay, and the ending has provided potential growth within the series, and I have to say the series did get better uh, as time went on. But it's just the cozy side really did let me down. I'm really not about the whole, you know, farm to table thing. It's just not my thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Obviously, it's a great thing. But it's just not something that particularly interests me. And I think, you know, my thought was because it's written by Amanda Flower, I'll love it anyway. And I just, I just didn't. It just didn't work for me. Again, keeping in mind all these books I'm talking about, I gave three stars to. So I'm not saying any of them are horrible. They just were average reads as opposed to amazing reads. And every time I pick up an Amanda Flower book, I'm expecting that I'm going to love them. And uh, yeah, it wasn't a book I loved. It was an average read. The next three star to talk about is Hitches, Hideouts and Homicides, which is book number seven in the Campers and Criminals uh, cozy mystery series. A lot of cozies here. In fact, are all my three stars cozies? Let's have a quick look here. Uh, all except for one, which we'll get to. All right, so, yeah, with this uh, particular book, um, so, yeah, very quick backstory about this Cozy Mystery series because I am still continuing on with this one. Um, we are following Mae West, who her partner was involved in a lot of fraud. They ended up breaking up. Uh, through the breakup, she was left one thing, which was a very run-down uh, caravan park. She moves there, gets to know the people, starts working at the caravan park to try and turn things around. And all of the books are interesting in their own way. They're all very short. They're somewhere between, you know, 120 and 250 pages. They're all novellas. Uh, but anyway, with this particular one, It had been an up and down journey with me for Campers and Criminals up to that point. Sometimes I like the cozy side, sometimes I like the mystery, but with this particular one, I thought the cozy side was good. Um, but, um, and because there was a hoedown that was included, but the mystery was not intriguing for me at all. And that's what turned the star rating around. It's interesting talking about my worst books for the first half of the year when it comes to three star rated books. Because there are certain things in books that can take them from a five, a four, or even a five star read and make them an average read. And in this particular case, had it been a contemporary and there was no mystery and it was just revolving around Mae West and Dottie Swaggart and all the others and this whole hoedown experience, it probably would have got five stars. But the mystery was an absolute letdown. And so because of that, you need to weigh out the, okay, the cozy side for me was a a five star read, but the mystery side was a one star. And the only way to average that out is to give it three stars. So yeah, um, that's how it becomes an average read because while there are some amazing things about it, there are some things that did let me down. And as I say, the mystery in this one just did not work for me. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk to you all about is um, uh, book number 10 in the Campers and Criminals. It's interesting because then I'm talking about 11, then I'm talking about 13. Then I am talking about 15, then I am talking about 17, then I am talking about 19, and then I'm talking about 22. So (laughs) I might as well just discuss Campers and Criminals as a whole. Look, there have been some great Campers and Criminals reads for me. Uh, I'm not seeing any that I've read this year that I gave five stars to, but there are some that I gave four stars to. So just to give you a quick example, Motorhomes, Maps and Murder, uh, book number five, I gave four stars to. And uh, recently... I read uh, book number 21, Lanterns, Lakes, and Larceny, and I gave that four stars as well. But, you know, some of these ones just really letting me down. All right, so since the majority of the three stars do revolve around campers and criminals, as I say, we'll talk about that now. So, uh, first of all, um, we're going to move on from what we just discussed, which was a little bit organized here. Okay, Hitches, Hideouts, and Homicides. And we're now going to move on to Sunset, Sabbatical, and Scandal. This is book number 10 in that series. 
And again, I ended up giving this the average rating of three stars. Look, it just wasn't as good as the others. I, in this particular book, I appreciated learning more about May's backstory as she needs to go back to her original home at one point with Hank, who is the love interest. But really, everything else just seemed rather um, blah. The victim uh, in this cozy mystery, her name was Trudy, and I had no investment in her, which in turn made the mystery boring for me. The reveal seemed very out of nowhere also, so, you know, we're just like, you know the reveal suddenly happened. And I don't know if you've experienced that in cozies, but I, a reveal to me works much better when we have the sleuth putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and then saying, ah, I know exactly who the killer is and making that reveal rather than it's suddenly happening. And it's I've, I, in the minority of cozies, I've experienced this, but let me know if you have as well, where there'll be a situation where the amateur sleuth is trying to work out who the killer is. And then all of a sudden, there is a gun being pointed to their head and they turn around and we know the killer is this person because the amateur sleuth was getting too close to finding out who they were but didn't know who they were. I mean, honestly, I feel like it's just really silly of the, the murderer to reveal themselves when the amateur sleuth hasn't even worked out who they are. And so that's what I'm calling a um, yeah, an out-of-nowhere reveal. The amateur sleuth doesn't know who the killer is, so therefore, because we follow their perspective, we do not know who the killer is. But now, the game's been given away because the killers reveal themselves. It's out of nowhere. That disappoints me. So I may enjoy a cozy, but that could let me down enough to dock a couple of stars, and suddenly the book becomes an average read. Why would one aspect of a cozy uh, be enough to knock down one or two stars? Because when it comes to any sort of a mystery, cozy mysteries being a subgenre of the mystery genre, the reveal uh, has a massive impact on the way that a book is going to be rated. Yes, you have the lead up to the reveal, going through all the clues and trying to work out who done it and why and all this, but the reveal needs to be impactful. If it is not, then ultimately the book is going to feel like a letdown. So, you know, it can definitely take a mystery, or in this case, a cozy mystery, from a book that I'm enjoying to a very average read, which was definitely the case with this one. Uh, now let's talk about book number 11, Tense Trails and Turmoils, again by Tonya Kappas, again, uh, the Camps and Criminals series. And with this one, I really didn't find it intriguing at all. I didn't know the person that died and therefore didn't have a ton of interest in the mystery. We'll talk about that in a moment. I also didn't enjoy most of May and Hank's time together in the book either. It's not a horrible book. It just wasn't to my tastes. And so, again, credit where it's due. A three-star book is not a four- or five-star book, but at the same time, it's not a two- or a one-star book. An average book is still an average book. It's not good or bad. It just is. But yes, let's talk about the big point here, which was I didn't know the person that died and therefore didn't have a ton of interest in the mystery. One of the things I love about cozies when they do it right is in the first couple of chapters, you get to know the victim when they do that, because sometimes, like this in this book, they don't. So let's just say that Regina is going to be the victim. In chapter one, we find out a little bit about Regina because our protagonist is talking to her at a party, and the following day, we uh, talk to Regina again, and Regina's complaining about something that happened at the party, for example. Then the following day, Regina is dead. We've gotten to know Regina, so we're invested in finding out why she died and who killed her. Now, let's take a look at a different scenario. The book opens up, we're following our protagonist, we don't know Regina, but our protagonist stumbles across Regina who is dead. The interest level may be there to try and work out how she died and why, because you love to solve a mystery, but there is no investment on this victim as a character, as a person, because you don't know them. And so it's a very different um, way of going through a mystery process. It's more of an objective read rather than an emotional subjective read. And because of that, it pulls me out of having an amazing experience because I'm not invested in them. And so it, being that they're a fictional character, why should I care? So that was the case with that particular one. 
Uh, moving on to book number 13, Gear, Grills and Guns. I have to say, again, Campus and Criminals, book number 13 by Tonya Kappas, Adult Cozy Mystery. I have to say the cover is absolutely beautiful. I love the cover. Unfortunately, as can sometimes be the case with me with other books as well, the cover can sometimes be the best thing about a book. So in this particular case, I felt like um, campers and criminals have been going through a slog at that point in time. There was nothing wrong with the book, um, or at least the last two that I'd read, but they were just not ex- as exciting as some of the others, and I was hoping it changed soon. I enjoy May sleuthing and love when Agnes makes an appearance, but otherwise the cover, again, makes it look more exciting than it was for me. Very quickly, the premise of this one, May West is bound to prove she deserves the seat she was appointed to on the National Park Committee, but when she brings a big car show to normal during the slower fall month, um, Wendy Holiday, Holiday's body is found dead in one of the Hampi Happy Trails campground bungalows, and one of the rentable campers is burned to the ground. May, along with the help of the laundry club ladies, once again put on their sleuthing caps to figure out who is trying to sabotage May and her new position on the committee. It just, yeah, it was a very blah read all round, this one. So we'll move on to the next one. Ropes, Riddles and Robberies, book number 15 in the exact same series. So I didn't like this one, uh, and I think that's for two reasons. One, I love the setting of Happy Trails, and in this particular book, we are predominantly away from there in this book. And number two, this was a cold case, and I don't like cold cases as I don't feel as invested. So yes, now we're going to go from what we were discussing earlier with this scenario with... um. The, the, the victim, I forgot her name, so now we'll just call her Alexandra. So, okay, in scenario one, we get to know Alexandria uh, in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, and then she dies, and so we're invested. In scenario two, we don't know Alexandria, the uh, protagonist stumbles upon Alexandria and goes, oh, we need to solve this, but we're not invested because we don't know her. We may be invested in the mystery of trying to work out who did it and why, but we're not invested in an emotional sense uh, because we feel bad for Alexandria because we don't know Alexandria. Now let's make it even worse. My least favourite sub-genre in cosy mysteries uh, or tropes in cosy mysteries is the cold case trope. I particularly don't like this in any sort of a mystery, but since we're talking about cosies, I will keep it to cosies. Cozy mysteries to me are exactly as the genre makes it sound. The perfect cozy mystery will be a mystery that is cozy. A cold case mystery to me is not cozy. It never has been. I have no investment in that. I don't know this person or these people. This person or these people died a very, very, very long time ago. The police have tried, the investigators have tried to solve the mystery. They weren't able to. The case became cold. It's reopened and we're trying to solve it again. I just really don't care. I definitely don't know you. Not only did you die before I got to know you, but you died years and years and years and years ago before the book even began. I care even less than I did about Alexandria, who may have died two days ago when I didn't know her. You, in this cold case, died five, ten years ago. I really just don't care. So already it takes a five-star read for me in a cozy to a four-star read, because I don't care. Now we add to that that I love Happy Trails, where all all of the other books are set, which is the caravan park itself in Campers and Criminals. And in this one, we aren't there. We aren't at the caravan park, so we're somewhere else. Sometimes it's good to take a holiday uh, in a cozy mystery because something fun may happen on that holiday. But in this particular case, that didn't happen. Moving on to book 17, Insects, IV and Investigations. And uh, with this particular one, you know, Okay, so we meet Alicia, okay, and (laughs) Alicia just really annoyed me in this book. I get that Tonya Kappas wants to put in different things here and there to keep the series interesting, I just don't think that it was a good idea. Um, Yeah, 
Alicia is claiming to be Mary Elizabeth Mobley's foster child. To make the connection, our protagonist, Maybelline West, is also um, Mary Elizabeth Mobley's um, foster child, but uh, May doesn't know Alicia. Alicia really annoyed me in the book. As I say, I get the Capus wants to put in different things here and there to keep the series interesting. I just don't think this was a good idea. The whole first half of the book annoyed me as a portrayed spousal abuse incorrectly. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes when I am rating a book, um, my rating will come back to information or the way that information is given on a topic that I'm well versed in incorrectly. I remember a couple of years ago, I was reading a cozy mystery where someone had brought up um, an Australian slang word, and it was an American book, and they brought up an Australian slang word, and they had gotten it in completely wrong, and it was incredibly uh, offensive. I, I, I don't remember what the word is, I'm sorry, because it's not a word I use in my everyday vernacular, but um, it's it, basically a um, a word not used in, in um, civilised conversation to put put down people from rural areas. But in this particular case, uh, the author was claiming that it meant that they are a, um, oh, what's the word that you can use on BookTube? Someone who sleeps with a lot of different people, if you know what I mean, which is a very different thing. <laughs> but anyway, and in this particular case, um, Alicia, the character, is talking about uh, going through spousal abuse. The way that it was portrayed, and I understand that spousal abuse can be represented in, and, and experiences that um, victims of spousal abuse can go through can vary. I do understand that. But the way that this was being presented just felt very wrong. Um, and so because of that, I did dock a star as well. So even if I loved the rest of the book, the fact that Alicia was annoying, the fact that spousal abuse uh, was being incorrectly represented already makes it an average read. I guess I loved the rest of the book because it didn't get two or one star. So that's a good thing. But yeah, that's more than enough for me to want to rate a book down. Uh, quickly moving on to Wildlife Warrants and Weapons, which is book number 19 in the series. And, okay, so with this one, I really didn't find it interesting. While I like May as a character in Dottie 2, the actual plot of this one just didn't intrigue me, and neither did the mystery. The reveal threw me off as I forgot who the killer actually was, which is weird for such a short book. So let's quickly jump onto that. So it's one thing to forget... So when you have the reveal of the killer, and let's say the killer is Alice, again, just naming a name, and um, we, in, in a really good mystery, we know who Alice is. So when the reveal happens, we go, oh my gosh, it was Alice, and we feel like the rug is ripped out from under us, and it's a fantastic reveal. But then you have certain cozies where in chapter one, Alice goes into the bakery where the protagonist works and she purchases a blueberry muffin. We don't see Alice again at all till the end of the book when we find out Alice is the murderer and we're going, hang on, who the heck is Alice? And then we go back to chapter one and go, oh, she was the friggin' person that went into the bakery and bought the muffin in chapter one? Really? <laughs> like, that is such a letdown if you don't know the person. And yeah, uh, what makes made it even harder with um, this particular book book, um, uh, Wildlife Warrants and Weapons, is that it's a short book. It is um, 199 pages long, so if I don't know who the killer is in such a short book, what is going on? <laughs> so there you go. Uh, and then finally, I want to mention Jackets, Jacko Lanterns and Justice, uh, which is book number 22, the latest book that I've read. I did like um, books 20 and 21. They got four stars from me, but uh, the latest one, 22, got um, the three stars. After enjoying the last two books in the series, this one sadly was an average read for me at best. We're basically dealing with Hank's sister, who has been accused of something she swears she didn't do. Look, I get that we need a mystery in every cozy, but this one could have done without it, or without this particular mystery. Hank's sister just got in the way of so much character development, especially between Hank and May, and it really annoyed me. Um, so yeah, quickly jumping onto that, it annoys me when we are going through a lot of character development and then character development is stumped uh, or stopped in its tracks because we need to deal with another thing to try and keep a series fresh. That annoys me. Had um, this character, uh, whatever her name is, Hank's sister, had she not 
um, stopped the character development between Hank and May, and we were still dealing with the sister anyway, it would have been fine, but she just put up this brick wall to the character development between May and Hank, and that really annoyed me. Alright, as always, I'm running out of time as I'm getting to the last two, so let's quickly discuss a horror, House Beneath the Bridge by Ian Rob Wright. Okay, I don't think it's fair to blame Ian Rob Wright in this one. Yes, I am biased. I love Ian Rob Wright as a horror author, but I was listening to this on audiobook, and the audiobook was a horrible experience uh, for me listening to it, because you had to turn it all the way up just to hear standard narration, and then all of a sudden he is screaming and yelling, so you have to turn it down, and up and down, and up and down, and up and down. It was a horrible experience for me. I didn't enjoy the book for that reason. And finally, the one book that received two stars from me was, uh, which was my lowest rated book for the first half of the year, the worst book, <laughs> is Glass Sword by Victoria Aveyard, book number two in the Red Queen uh, Quartet. It is a YA dystopian series, and I DNF'd the series after reading this book. So, one thing that annoys me about YA dystopians is when the protagonist ends up going on a travelling slash questing journey where they don't know where they're going, they don't know how they're going to get there, and quite frankly, it's rather pointless because they don't need to. And in this particular case, they didn't need to go on the travelling slash questing trope, and that annoys me even more. I don't like travelling slash questing tropes where you don't know where you're going because it's heedless travel. You don't know how you're going to get there. Again, it's heedless travel. But also, you don't need to go on this <laughs> travelling slash questing trope. Again, it is heedless travel. Why, 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 why? Now, I did pick up book number three in this series and they went back to the original place that they were, which I wanted to experience, and it just still wasn't entertaining me enough, so I ended up DNFing that third book. But um, what annoyed me in it, what annoys me with the traveling slash questing trope in dystopians, and let me make this quite plain, is that what sells a dystopian for me is the world building of how it has become a dystopian world. If your main character moves out of that dystopian world to go and travel and doesn't experience the dystopian side of that world, how is it still a dystopian? That really annoys me. I was having a chat with someone recently. It was Pat, actually. Thank you, Pat, for our great discussions and for the comments you've left me on my videos. We were discussing dystopians, and it's very common for why a dystopian uh, protagonist to go on a traveling slash questing journey and take us away from the whole point of the book being a dystopian. So yeah, that really annoyed me, and I'm hoping to find a dystopian that I love. Next year, I read two dystopians last year that were very average. I DNF this one. I do love dystopians when they are done well, so time will tell. So there you go. Those are the worst books that I read uh, with some explanations along the way in the first half of 2024. What were some of the worst books you read, and more importantly, why in the first half of 2024 were they the worst books for you, that is. Let me know in the comment section below. But in the meantime, letting you all go with peace, blessings, and so, so, so much love. Please do be kind and love one another and spread your sparkling energy all throughout the world. And until next time, when we come back with a more positive video, <laughs> happy reading. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.